fasten your seat belts and come along for the ride to see a great speaker in action who sets up captivating stories. Learn from the master, Mickey Williams. She's a brand all her own, with big hair, big jewelry, and a larger-than-life personality. Mickey is a Hall of Fame speaker and TEDx favorite who was chosen one of the top speakers in the country, along with Tony Robbins, Bill Gates, and Jay Leno. Mickey is sought after among executive speech coaches. Watch this episode of Pause for Purpose to find out why. Okay, I'm going to start, and as people join in, um, we will certainly welcome them, but we certainly won't interrupt Mickey in her message. I have, uh, this is really a real treat, uh, this uh, session. I've known Mickey 30 years. We started our businesses together um, in our entrepreneurial world, um, trying to become somebody before we were somebody. So I'm really pleased to introduce you to somebody who's had multiple careers, multiple successes, and um, I'm going to introduce her and say uh, Mickey Williams is an explorer, an explorer of life and people, and especially of herself. A lady with eclectic tastes and a multitude of talents. She's an inspirational humorist and business motivator, internationally recognized as a speaker, author, executive speech coach, TEDx speaker, transformational storyteller, and entrepreneur extraordinaire. Flamboyant and outrageous, yet delivering substance and heart. She is a sequin in the world of khaki. If, it wasn't, if she wasn't born a girl, she is convinced she would possibly be a drag queen today. <laughs> Mickey was honored as the Outstanding Woman of the Decade by the United Nations, and we know that Sandy Timmerman is very heavily involved in the United Nations, bringing peace to the world, right, Sandy? Um, she was featured, Mickey was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, presented two times at the White House, and at President Mandela's South African home. She has spoken in every U.S. state, every Canadian province, and even every continent in the world except Antarctica, where she can't wear her stilettos, stilettos, high heels. <laughs> um, she holds the designation of CSP, Certified Speaking Professional, an honor bestowed on fewer, excuse me, that's my, it's, gotta close the door, sorry, that's not supposed to happen. Obviously, I'm in a home office. <laughs> um, let's start that over. She holds the designation of CSP, Certified Speaking Professional, an honor bestowed on fewer than 700 speakers worldwide. Mickey was also inducted into the Speakers Hall of Fame. Fewer than 1% of speakers achieve this distinction, including Ronald Reagan, Norman Vincent Peale, um, and several others. Mickey is based now in Naples, Florida, uh, an only child, but the favorite. Uh, additionally, she a master chair for two executive peer advisory boards and an award-winning speaker for Vistage International, the world's leading executive membership organization. She's had nine successful careers, um, proving that um, she can't hold a job, but she sure can hold an audience. Her speaking engagements here allowed her to lunch in Israel, in the Israeli desert, romp in a German spa, shop in Singapore, pet the kangaroos in Africa, and she has so much energy, it's been said she makes coffee nervous. Mm -hmm. Meetings and Convention Magazine listed the best speakers in the country, and the list included Tony Robbins, Bill Gates, Lou Holtz, and today's speaker, Mickey Williams, who believes you can be different and still make a difference. So we welcome Mickey today. <coughs> so, yeah. Mickey, my first question that we start everyone out with is, um, how are you living your purpose? Well, purpose to me is intention. So when I think about intentionality, I think what's always driven me is the word legacy. 
And I feel that I, everything I do is the intention of making a difference somewhere in the world so that my time in the world, which is a gift, has meaning and purpose to the people that I leave behind in some way. So I didn't always know that, but as I reflect back at this stage of my life, I start to see a commonality that made me realize my purpose has been legacy for a long time. Is your purpose today the same as it's been when you were a professional dancer or when you were at Ithaca College? No, I think my purpose changed at various stages of my life. I had one purpose in life, Miss Vic, and I don't know if that's a separate question or it's coming too early in the interview. You but didn't there. This is impromptu. Feel go. It would probably help everybody to know because everything that came after that was a result of that defining moment. My one purpose in life was to become a wife and mother. I grew up uh, with a single parent, my mom. Uh, my dad left when I was four. I had no brothers and sisters. Uh, I had a wonderful childhood, but I always said someday when I grow up, I want to have that family that I never had as a young child. And that was my purpose and it was very clear for a long time. And the old saying that when we make plans, God laughs. Well, at the age of 29, my husband was killed in a car accident. And I was a 29 year old widow with a two year old child. I had no job. I had a mortgage. I had very little life insurance. So if I was giving this in a speech that would have been shared in a much more dramatic and much more emotional, heartfelt way rather than the way I stated it as a fact. But being this is an interview, it's, I wanted it to be the fact that it is. So you'll understand when Vicki asked me that question about uh, purpose, that was my purpose. That drove everything. And that changed in an instant. And I was probably at a point where I had no purpose other than to survive for myself and my two-year-old son at the time. And then when I started my first careers, uh, the first one being dance, I was in college, I was a phys ed teacher and a dance major. I had, been done, I had done professional dancing. And so I took those, uh, that activity and turned that into something that could make money to support us. We were left with very little. And I was also a really good cook. And so I had very famous clientele at my dance studio in Westport, Connecticut. I had, uh, for some of you who are, might be older than 25, you'd know Joanne Woodward and Eileen Heckert and Diana Ross's kids and another little known person named Martha Stewart who we started our catering businesses together in 1978. She just went a little further than I did. Anyway, uh, that's a long answer to a question and of course it goes on and on, but that was my purpose. And then it changed, at, I think at every decade of my life my purpose changed until I reflected back to give you the word legacy. Okay. So you told me a while back that you are the happiest now that, that you've ever been. Elaborate on that and why and what makes this the happiest time in your life. Well, I can do it from the trite to the most important. I have the car of my dreams. I've never owned a really a great car. I stopped driving for 25 years when I moved to Chicago because I didn't need one. So now I have my cute little Mercedes convertible. I have uh, the man of my dreams. I got engaged in Italy last August. I have the new house of my dreams that we're building together in Naples, Florida. The new home in the state of my dreams, despite the bugs and frogs and alligators. Uh, I'm grateful for living in Florida. Um, and I have health and I have the lifestyle that I've always wanted. I work when I want. I'm at a stage in my career that I'm successful enough that I can say yes to the jobs I want, and no to the jobs and work as much or as little as I want. So I can't think of anything else that would round out that sentence as to why I'm the happiest I've ever been. That's it. Okay. Did you go about planning? Because you became your own brand. You are a brand. Mickey Williams is a brand. How did that come about? And what do you do to keep your brand alive? If you work for a company, can you have a personal brand essence or do you have to be an entrepreneur? Vic, that was like five questions in one. Well, <laughs> maybe just pick one. <laughs> yeah, I am a brand and I have to tell you, I call myself an accidental brand because I became one before they even had the term branding. And how did I do that? 
and I can't take credit for it, just something I did. I can't say it was a brilliant technique, but what I did is I exploited what everybody said about me. Oh, she's the speaker with the big hair. She's the speaker with the big jewelry. She's the speaker with the, the shoe fetish. She's the speaker with the wild clothes. She's very flamboyant. She's very outrageous. And the more I would hear these terms repeated, I thought, okay, well, that's how they remember me. So let's use that. Let's use that as the, the platform to really create a brand. And that's what I did. I mean, I sign everything, be outrageous. My mantra, which is copyrighted, uh, trademarked is be outrageous. It's the only place that isn't crowded. So everything I did was a, a result of being an accidental brand. Now, interestingly enough, um, Vicki talked about Vistage. So I coached executives and I was coaching one yesterday and one today actually in the UK and they both asked me the same question because one of them is starting a new business and one of them is the CEO of a utility company. Very different. The one entrepreneur starting a business, one CEO of you. They both asked me the same question about branding. And I said, all right, let's talk about the virtual world. What I'm doing right now, folks, I am branding. Being on with Vicki and Joyce and the purpose whole theme here, that's branding. Because every week I am on another podcast, webinar, writing an article or something. So for those of you who are starting businesses and you want to create a brand, I've always, you know, to quote myself, which I love to do, and I, <laughs> I used to say visibility creates credibility, which leads to profitability. If you're very visible everywhere, they see you in the paper, they see you on a Zoom call, they see you on a podcast, they just assume you're the expert, you're important. Who is that person? I just read about them last week. I just saw them this week, blah, 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 blah. And all of that has always worked for me, as simple as it sounds. That's really what it is. Did I answer that, Miss Vick? Yes, you did, Miss Mick, quite, quite uh, eloquently, I might add. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you're a national speaker, very renowned, uh, choose now where you want to go. You're not flying around as much as you were uh, when you were in Chicago. Um, COVID kind of caused, caused us all to pivot, but you're a great storyteller. So when you help your audiences or those who sign up for your speaker school, how to tell a story, how do you set up a story and, and how do you dig it out of a person when a person says, I don't, I don't have an interesting story. How do you, how do you dig that out? It's so funny you put it that way because yes, I run speaker schools and I always think on day one when people say I have no stories, I have to laugh because the day you were born was a story. Maybe you don't know it, maybe you do, maybe you've never asked, but you, you get stories absolutely every single day. Now to become a good storyteller, a good speaker, that's a whole different skill set because one, one of the challenges is in my profession is that because we all have the, the God-given gift or the human resource of talking, we naturally assume we're, we can speak and talking is not speaking. So for those people who have to be eloquent and, and really give presentations and become a great storyteller, there's a skill set that goes into that. Anyone with a great personality who talks does not become an international professionally paid speaker. Unfortunately, that's part of the thing that everybody thinks, oh, I'm gonna be a speaker, that's a lot of fun, I'm gonna travel the world, and I'm gonna make a lot of money, and well, I, you know, it's a craft. It's an absolute craft that I've worked at. So to give you an example, I give you the structure of a story. And I didn't make this up, this, you can go back and look up Pixar and Disney. They use the same story structure that we still use today. I mean, there's, there's mega models, but I'll give you the basic one. And in the spirit of transparency, let me tell you this. I've been hooked on the Hallmark Channel every night because at eight o'clock comes these stories that I know how they're going, but they're mindless and they're happy and they make me smile. And the other night I was thinking, oh my God, this so follows the story structure. No wonder I know what's going to happen. All right, so let's take The Wizard of Oz, because I, I think we have everybody of an age or uh, an American. I don't know if I have any Canadians or international people, so I apologize if I'm using The Wizard of Oz if you don't know what it is. So a story starts with an everyday setup. Dorothy goes to sleep every night, right? That's every day. Uh, John is driving a car, blah, blah, blah. Mary went to the food store. A story always starts with an everyday. And then it has what's called rising action 
or attention. Something's happening that's keeping people interested. So when Dorothy goes into the sleep and all of a sudden she gets whirled away by the tornado, this is a rising action because we don't know what's going to happen as a result of that. And then there's also some challenges along the way. She goes along the path and she meets the scarecrow and she and each one of these builds suspense in the story because they're each little aha moments or turning points or dynamics. Something changes each moment until you get to a certain point in the story where it's, oh, yes. And then you come down to the resolution. So a story follows an arc. Every day, something changes, something changes, something happens. Oh, I get it, I get it. Oh, here's the end of it. And so what happens after Dorothy realizes she's gotta to get to the, the wicked witch, she gotta kill the wicked witch, and then she's gotta get the shoes to the wizard, and then she gets to go home, because all she ever wanted to do was to go home. And when she gets home, what's the moral of the story? When she realizes she never went anywhere in the first place, the answers were inside of herself. So as I watch these Hallmark movies every night, it's this love story, love story, love story. Oh, there's a villain, there's an affair, there's a, something happens, and then they wind up living happily ever after. Same storyline every night. Watch the Hallmark channel. You'll see a perfect example of what I just told you. Thanks, Mick. Um, <clears throat> How should one create their own sense of uniqueness and how should that uniqueness be packaged? Interesting choice of words. I don't think someone should create their own uniqueness. I think they should find their own uniqueness. And whether that's in the way you look, because I wear big earrings and a big hair, or whether it's uh, in the style you speak, or it's the hobbies you have, or the degrees or the intellect. I mean, there is no rule anywhere that says you have to create some kind of persona. I believe there's a uniqueness in every one of us. And if I go back to my using the word exploit in a positive way, exploit that uniqueness, that's how you accomplish both questions that she's asking, finding your brand and, and also finding your place. I think the challenge sometimes I know with all the people I coach is, is sometimes them finding it themselves without being asked the right questions for them to get, oh yeah, I'm gonna give you a perfect anecdote on that. I had a gal who came to speaker school, didn't know what she wanted to speak on. And one day we were doing this one exercise and in the exercise it came out that she had 13 adopted special needs brothers and sisters. And I'll never forget her name was M. she came from Indiana. And I said, M, did you ever think on speaking on diversity? Oh, what a great idea. I have so many stories. And it was really just that simple thing that I asked the question that she didn't even realize she had the answer to. And I think that's within all of us. So it's finding your uniqueness, not creating it. What's the advantage of, uh, of that when you want to promote yourself, uh, <clears throat> when you meet someone that you're pitching for a business? What's the advantage of the uniqueness, finding your uniqueness? and presenting it. You know, in the business world, we call it USP, your unique selling proposition. I often challenge the executives that I work with, not just to have their mission statement, their values and all that. What's your USP? What makes you different? And that's a hard question for even heads of companies to come up with. They come up with these trite things. Well, our customer service is really good. Oh, really? That differentiates you? I don't think so. And again, another anecdote comes to mind. I have tons of these. Sorry, folks. Um, I was in the UK and I was doing a marketing seminar and for a bunch of uh, health club owners. And I was asking everybody, what makes you different? What makes you special? And somebody would say, well, we have certified aerobic instructors. And I'd look at the crowd and say, raise your hand if you have certified aerobic instructors. And like everybody raised their hand. Well, we have really clean clubs. Raise your hand if you have a clean club. So there were all these generic statements when all of a sudden, one guy in the front row, and this is like 25 years ago, I can't believe I'm remembering this. One guy in the front row points to the guy in the back row and says, I know why he's unique. He's won the triathlon in the UK five years in a row. And, I, and so the guy looked surprised and I said, why aren't you using that in your marketing? Anybody else in this room, raise your hand if you've won the UK triathlon five years in a row. Nobody had. So why wasn't he using that as a differentiator? You know, one of the things in my own intro, I was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I think in the thousands of audiences, I've asked that question, 
maybe one other person ever answered it and they weren't even on the front page. So use the, the unique things about you. I don't care if you were Girl Scout in a time that, before there were Girl Scouts or you sold the most Girl Scout cookies. Just go back and find that uniqueness and then exploit it. Okay. Um, you've had, um, you're a serial entrepreneur, certainly. And you've always told me that it's a big, it's always important to have multiple streams of income. Yes, MSI. MSI. MSI, multiple streams of income. Yeah. So describe how you go about it, how you keep those streams of income coming in, and how you um, plan to make those things happen. How do you bundle it? The best way I can answer that is to give you an example of right now. So I became a professional speaker a, a little over 30 years ago, and that was just the one thing that I was doing. And then I was also, about five years after that, I got involved with Vistage International, where I was speaking for them, but also I became a chair of these executive think tanks. And then I started doing some coaching. And then I brought back my speaker school. And then I realized as I was doing that, when the recession hit in 2009, speakers were going out of business left and right because the events industry went in the toilet, kind of like right now. Nobody was traveling after 9-11 after and then nobody was traveling again during the recession and nobody was having conferences. And I was doing fine because I had Vistage, I had coaching, I had speaker school. And that's when it really hit me about MSI, multiple streams of income. I will never again rely on just one income stream. And the other thing is, you know, being an entrepreneur, you get that old, what's that saying, Vic, we had a shiny object syndrome. Oh, I'll do that. I'll do that. Oh, I can sell magnets. Oh, yeah. I'll, I can walk dogs. Oh, yeah, I can do that. And I've done that. I've got that T-shirt. Doesn't work. Everything I have now feeds everything else that I have now. If you're a, a coaching client, you can be, come to speaker school. You could hire me as your coach. You could become my Vistage member. Everything I do, so if you took a mind map and you had me in the center of it, all the spokes that go out, they're all interrelated. So it's like I can upsell and I can also count on no matter what happens, I'm gonna have income because if one's affected, I have others that aren't affected. I was um, fortunate to uh, be with M Mickey on many events and awards and recognition. And um, she invited me to join her in Philadelphia when she was inducted into the Speaker's Hall of Fame. Very crowded place. I sat at a table with friends of Mickey that I knew. Her son, um, Kathy and others. And there was this one lady and I asked her who she was because I didn't know who she was. And she wouldn't tell me. She's <laughs> avoided it. And she says, well, you'll hear about it. Well, how, when will I hear about it? And she says, wait till Mickey accepts her award. So Mickey, why don't you share the story of your experience uh, at, uh, when you went to the first National Speakers uh, Association conference to being inducted into the Speakers Hall of Fame? Yeah, one of my favorite stories for a lot of reasons you'll you'll all understand when i first joined the national speakers association i was if you can picture it 20 times more flamboyant than i am now i mean i was dolly parton on steroids picture it rhinestone sequins you name it i was it i arrived they did not take me very seriously but then again that's kind of been my my whole life because i've always been like that it's really who i am i think you know i've never met a sequin i didn't like i've been uh, dancing since i was four so i was always kind of in a show business personality so i was always like that and i've kind of been used to it and thank goodness that i had a mom who instilled in me that i'm comfortable with who i am and i always have been and so when they ignored me during these two years, completely ignored me, everybody thought, oh, she's not going to be back next year. There was a one woman who was, some of you might know, a very famous NFL referee named Jim Tunney. And he became a professional speaker, and he had an assistant named Nancy Hirsch. And Nancy Hirsch befriended me those two years. She was the only person who really spoke to me. She was the only person who motivated me. You can do this. She kept in touch with me. And she was, you know, she was probably about 10, 15 years older than me at the time. And then, I don't know, after a year or two, whatever, we lost touch. She, I, he dropped out, and so I never really saw Nancy again. Well, fast forward 30 years, 
and I was announced to being inducted in the Speaker Hall of Fame. They only choose five inductees and it's very prestigious to be inducted. I thought, who do I want there? Nancy Hirsch. I don't know if she's still alive. I don't know where she lives. I don't know if she'd remember me, but she was the first person I thought of. So thanks to Google and other things we have available to us today, I found Nancy Hirsch in Santa Barbara, California at the ripe young age of 81. And I called her up and I said, hi, Nancy, I don't know if you remember me this, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get emotional every time I tell this story. And I, I said, I don't know if you remember me, Mickey. Oh, Mickey, my gosh, it's so great to hear you. I've been following your career. And anyway, from that, I flew her to Philadelphia with her son's permission, because she was 81, she was a little frail, she uses a cane. And my assistant at the time offered to stay in the room with her, share the room. And she came, she had a flower in her hair, she had a sequin dress. And when I got through my speech, I, I was only allowed seven minutes. And actually you can go see this speech, which I'm very proud of. Uh, you just have to put in Mickey Williams Induction Speaker Hall of Fame, it's on YouTube. And you can actually hear the seven minute speech where I talked about how nobody spoke to me and I built up the suspense and then I finally told him about Nancy and then I asked her to stand up. And there wasn't a dry eye in the room and the applause was thunderous and it was really one of the highlights of my life. Yeah. And what point did you want to make when you uh, yeah. summed up your speech? What was your concluding message? Um, gosh, well, my last line, you don't mean my last funny line, you do. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. So just a little background on that. I knew someday I would be inducted. I had the speech made up in my head for 20 years. I knew that I wanted to be able to, in a very classy but professional way, get the message across about how I was rejected for so long, how I kept my head held high, uh, doing well is the best revenge, so succeeding in my career. I had all that going for me the whole time, but I didn't have a closing line until about a week before the speech when I was coming out of my own bathroom in my own apartment and I have a variety of little plaques hanging on the wall. And I had this one plaque hanging on the wall of my apartment for a long time and I looked at it and I went, that's it. And so after I delivered this seven minute speech to 3000 professional speakers and dignitaries from all over the world, I said this, if there's one thing I've learned in this 30 year career, it's simply this. If you wear enough pretty lipstick, sparkly jewelry, and great shoes, no one will notice the size of your ass. <laughs> and that was it. And so there was thunderous applause and laughter and screaming. And the MC, so if you do watch it, don't shut it off when I say my last line. Wait till the MC comes back on because he was so flustered by what I said. He's even funnier. <laughs> So, so you traveled the world over. You were always on an airplane. You yeah. met a lot of interesting people. Yeah. Who was the most interesting that you met and why? Oh, you know, that's an interesting question. I've been asked that kind of like, what's your favorite place in the world too? Or what's your favorite of all your nine businesses too? It's always the one that I'm in or the place that I'm at or the person I've just heard. And for example, I just heard a speaker a couple weeks ago, Vistage had a women's leadership conference and she was fabulous. Now folks, I don't use that word lightly. I'm an executive speech coach, I'm a professional speaker. So for me to say fabulous, they have to have great speaking skills, a great message and a great story delivered in a powerful way. And she was all of them. Her name was Nicole Malakowski. And she was one of the first female Blue Angels, fighter pilots, et cetera. And she, every, so this was a women's leadership conference. And I was so moved by the chat room because all through the chat room was, I want my daughter to hear this. I want my mother to hear this. I want my sister to hear this. I want my husband to hear this. I mean, it was continuous. She was so inspired. Her story was mind boggling. Go to her website. Don't ask me, Malakowski, M-A-L. O-W-S-K-I, Nicole Malakowski. Um, and her stories were incredible. 
incredible story. And what I do when I coach people on speaking is helping them become great storytellers because the old days of just dumping facts does not work anymore. You've got to invest people through story to get them to care about your facts. So she was an incredible storyteller with unbelievable stories, a real twist at the end and very inspiring and humorous and self-effacing. And if I had to critique it, she was 100% on everything. She was great. So there you have it. Each right. new one that I hear replaces the old one. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what was it like being at now, uh, speaking in South Africa for, at, um, with Nelson Mandela? What was that like? That was, again, just, I am so blessed. I've had so many great highlights of my career. I got to travel the world in my first three years. I had one job that had an international audience and it catapulted me in, into international speaking. So I literally did the whole world in the first three years. And uh, I was invited to South Africa to speak for the life insurance agents of South Africa. And that's a very long trip. I was in New York at the time, or Connecticut, I think. I don't know, it was 26 hours. And I just didn't really want to go to South Africa for 26 hours for one gig. So I kind of leveraged everything that I did into making it an entire trip. And rather than go into detail, I'll just give you a 360 overview. Uh, through networking, which is one of my main things, Vicki and I always talked about how we built our careers through networking. I knew I was going to South Africa. So I, every conference I spoke at, every conference I attended, I'd look at everybody's name badges till I'd see people and I, I'd say, oh, Carol, you're from South Africa. And I'd make a beeline over and introduce myself and say, Carol, I'm coming to South Africa. And they'd say, oh, really, when? Well, I'm coming to speak for this. Oh, you can't come to South Africa without coming to to Cape Town. So each person would want me to come to their place. So fast forward or backwards, my one trip, my one engagement turned into this. I flew into Joburg. My best friend Kathy and I got to stay at a Relay and Chateau five-star game lodge in exchange for me speaking to Zulu warriors and their children. We got a free safari for the two of us. Then I spoke to Liberty Life, the biggest insurance company in South Africa. Then from there, I went to Sun City, which is the Las Vegas of South Africa, where I spoke to the life insurance agents. Then I went on to Cape Town, where I spoke for all the citizens of Cape Town. And then I went on to Durban, which is on the Indian Ocean, where Mandela's home is, to speak for the head of the conglomerate of all the major automobile associations. And while I was traveling to Durban, a gal who had been in my, and by the way, I was the first speaker after apartheid. It was 1994 and Mandela was, had just been wow. released. And I was the first American speaker. So it was a big deal that they had an American speaker traveling through South Africa. And so while I was there, I'm at the last leg, this gal who had heard me speak in New York and she was from Durban, South Africa, asked me if I could stay an extra day or two if she could arrange something very special. And I said, sure. And I didn't know what it was. Well, she had attended my networking seminar at Club Industry in New York. I remember that. And what she did is she went to the premier. Uh, so Durban is in the province of Natal. They don't have presidents. They have premiers. She went to the premier of Natal and said, we have an American speaker traveling. Could we host her on the great lawn of President Mandela's home? And that's what happened. So I was under a white organ tent, and they debuted the new South African anthem. They debuted the new South African flag. I got to tour his home. He unfortunately was at the White House at the time, but that was the end of my South African trip, which was just that one gig for life insurance agents. So yeah, it was a spectacular, spectacular trip. So maybe you just one other little one. I spoke in Israel and the last day of my Israel trip, they took the speakers out into Jeeps, into the Negev desert. And they stopped the Jeep in the middle of the desert where you couldn't see anything. There was no horizon, kind of like beyond the ocean. And behind this rock formation, they set up a long table with white tablecloths and crystal and china and gave us our last meal of the tour in the desert. And my going away gift was a picture of this table standing alone in the Negev desert. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very cool. Mickey, you, uh, it, you, you kind of triggered something. You and Chris Le Leach yes. are very good friends. Yes. And uh, you were invited, I think it was to speak at, the, was she the million dollar round table? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So she didn't know you <laughs> and you, you show up and you're the speaker. Describe what 
thoughts went through Chris Leach's mind as she booked you for this million dollar round table? Okay, so, she, well, she didn't book me. Million dollar round table did. She was an attendee, all right? She runs okay. a financial services business in the UK. And if we do travel the world together, we've been friends for 25 years. And people always want to know, because she's from Wales, how did you two meet? So she's told the story a thousand times. She loves to tell the story. So I was attending my regular convention. This is Chris talking. And in comes this speaker, this brash American, New York, flamboyant, big hair, bright yellow, sequin top, and I hated her. <laughs> that's how she described, that's how she tells the story to everybody. And then she hated me through the whole conference. Well, she was invited to Israel, the same trip that I just told you about. And on that day, we went in the Negev desert. If you've ever sat in a Jeep, you face each other. And oh my gosh, she faced me. She thought to herself that her worst nightmare came true. <laughs> and we've been best friends for 25 years. <laughs> Okay, Mickey, today um, it seems we are hearing the word purpose a lot. There's a lot going on about the purpose movement. Chadwick Boseman, who um, passed away uh, at age 43 from um, oh, cancer, can't remember the kind, um, he spoke to the graduating class at Howard University. And his message to the class was, you're going to run into challenges, but it made, it was the news clip that every national news story picked up about him. And the words were, you have to press on with purpose. Joe Biden talks about <clears throat> how, because of what he's experienced in loss in his life, when he meets somebody who also experienced a loss, he will say, it gives me purpose when I can share with them how to deal with loss. So why do you think we're hearing so much about purpose now? It seems to be emerging in, in a lot of dialogue, in a lot of, lot of uh, media. Why do you think that is so? For me, when you strip away all the, the material things in life, you kind of get left with the things that are really most important. Purpose, mm -hmm. attitude, intentionality, yeah. prayer meditation, gratitude. Uh, so for me, especially now in this virtual world and this challenges we face economically, po politically, health-wise, et cetera, I think that's when we always turn back to those things that are most important to us. You know, if I could tie it back kind of to the beginning question about my early purpose and why I came up with the idea that really legacy has been my purpose. I look back on all my careers and they were very eclectic from a dance studio to a, a catering business to coaching CEOs to everything. I think that I left something not for them, but something in them. And mm -hmm. that became very special to me. That's how I define legacy and why it's so important. My dancers, some of them still uh, talk about what I did for them in those days. I taught them to be self-reliant. I made them go out and raise money for their dancings. And now they, they have the, the self-esteem to do that. And so every career that I had, there's always been people that have come back to me and shared what a difference I made. And that's why I love what I, all the business I've had. It's never been driven by money or, or goals. It's been driven by an intentionality of legacy, and that's not leaving something for people, but leaving something in people. Very good. And I think that's a great way to pause and uh, enable those who have joined us today to ask Mickey any questions they might have. Don't all speak at once. Unmute, folks, unmute. I have a question. Here, Jill. I do too. Uh, I, oh, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's such a pleasure to hear your story, Mickey. It's really amazing. Um, I live in Norwalk, close to Westport. So it was kind of when you were I, I you were talking about your dancing and your um, catering, which was very interesting. Um, I think 
you the most important thing that that and that affects me you you have such chutzpah mm -hmm. and so much self confidence and i wondered how that started and how you developed all that it's a great question jill thank you and i think for me the answer is twofold i was very fortunate because i did i was raised by a single mom who was she was tough tough stuff right ms vick yeah. yeah and she instilled in me because i was always different i just was and and she would always tell me it's okay to be different so I never smoked as a teenager. I, I, you know, I was, I never faced peer pressure because I always felt that it was okay to be who I am. And that got reinforced for me after Gabe died. You know, that old saying about what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, it did. And so after it did, the chutzpah, what am I going to be afraid of? What the risk and taking chances and change, all those things that we all fear, uh, became irrelevant to me. And so my purpose, again, going back to purpose, in being a professional speaker, is I get to share that with people and give them permission without waiting for a defining moment like I had, but to make a choice to grab that chutzpah or whatever it is for you and just do it. it just It's kind of giving people permission to be who they are that's part of what I represent. And the other part is to give them permission to, to go for what they want because I did without, because I was forced to, and you have a choice to. Did that answer that for you, Jill? Yes, it did. But I guess the question then to follow up with that, what, um, what, if, what if you're shy and uh, when you, I, I'm a teacher, so um, how do you help children that might be very and people that might be extremely shy and introverted how do you and they have to speak okay let's say they have to give a, a report or something in front of other uh, class how, and they're terrified so how do you do that yeah and you know i have a client right now who went from that to being <clears throat> an extrovert almost an extrovert when he has to be he's still an introvert so for me, I look back at my college days, Jill, and I was petrified to do swimming. I was a phys ed major, and I had to jump off the high diving board to pass my exam. And I never forgot the teacher who actually got on the high board with me and jumped off with me. And so I would say the answer is for you to be with that child who is not to hold their hand or to stand next and to let them know, I will be here when you do that because I am a little nervous too and I need you to help me. I never forgot him going off that board with me. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great answer. You're welcome. <laughs> Meg, you had a question? I do, I, I wanna say how sad I am. I had another meeting and I was late and I missed some of your early stories, but you are, an amazing storyteller and speaker and I also uh, resonate very strongly with your purpose of legacy because I actually wrote a book on legacy. Oh. Um, but my question is sort of mundane in a way but how have you changed your technique or approach or anything um, to be so effective on Zoom? Did you have to do anything? Yes. No, great question. Yeah, I did almost immediately. You know, that saying, no grass grows under my feet. I was not waiting uh, because I, uh, everybody was whining and complaining and said, and I thought, okay, I got to pivot. I don't know how, and I'm not a technology person. So I used to be very intimidated by the technology part of it. And I talked myself right out of it and said, why do I have to use technology? I don't use it when I speak. I don't use slide. I've never even used PowerPoint. I wouldn't know how to turn on a projector. I said, so why do I have to do that as long as I know how to engage? And to me, engagement is the most important thing. So when I do my Zoom meetings, nobody's allowed to be on mute. I call on everybody constantly. 
Nobody has time to look at email because if I call and you hope and you weren't paying attention, you'll be embarrassed. So you're going to pay attention. So it's all about, it's one of the things that I teach when I coach people or they come to speaker school. It's how do you keep people engaged? And just because you're on Zoom, don't put on a different hat and saying, okay, now I'm in Zoom. If you couldn't keep them engaged in person, you're not going to do it this way. And if you did it before, you can do it on this. Just don't give your head trash enough space to th make you think it's that different. Engagement is engagement. I really believe that. But you know, I was, my husband is trying, he's a professor and he's trying to learn. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's trying, no, no, I'm just saying he's trying very hard. And there's all, there are whole books about, um, about, you know, how to engage. And basically what surprised me about you is you could, because of how, animated I think and the story quality and how practiced um, you can hold that engagement um, he in a in a um, they had to role play a student and he said boy after five or ten minutes of a professor lecturing you know that's where I zoned out and so um, I, I think Vicki you probably we're really good about the questions and um, and it's so so I think you made it work maybe just <laughs> I don't know because of special gifts or something because it's not it's been very challenging for him yeah it, it, it's not special gifts it's as I said earlier it's not you know people think talking is speaking and it's not it's a craft that, that's what I'm teaching people. I'm teaching them how to be effective yeah. storytellers. I'm teaching yeah. them how to structure a speech. I'm teaching a skill set that we don't have just because we can talk. So that's what he's dealing with right now. Right. You know? And certainly if I can help at some point, you know, you know how to get a hold of me. And by the way, Meg, Vicki, you recorded this, right? So people right. can hear this. Yes. Yeah, you can hear the rest of it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I may, I, I think I'm going to give it to him too, although he'd be upset that I was using him as an example. So <laughs> would you all please not repeat that? <laughs> I or hope. at least not give my name, please. <laughs> I hope. Um, you have a question for Mickey? Oh, I, I just want to say that, you know, in the simplest terms, I think Nikki just is so good at bringing the inside of a person out and giving them permission to be that human being with everybody else. And there's so much of us that have to gain off of that from everybody else. You're fabulous, Nikki, and I knew that before, but... <laughs> I just want to say hi. Hi. It's nice to see you one on one, finally. Finally. And, and I and I want you to know, Vicky, that yesterday I was telling Jim, who actually my husband, who is a professor as well, <laughs> um, who's doing very well on Zoom, and maybe we should get our husbands together. Good idea. Um, <laughs> but um, I was thinking and telling Jim yesterday how impressed I was. Vicki, how you and your partner have started out with a certain intention for, for the purpose project and how you pivoted so beautifully into something that I think is probably, and I say probably because it's unproven, probably far more effective for more people than you could have reached with your original plan. And, and I just admire that so greatly. And I just wanted to say thank you for that too. Thank you, Hope, for that. Yes, Joyce and I pivot and at the end of at, at the every at the end of every Zoom call, when people click, click, hang up, leave, 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 it's Joyce and I. And we kind of go like this and go, what the hell did we get ourselves into? <laughs> Where do we go with this? So does anyone else have any questions for Mick Sandy? Yeah. Uh, okay, Mickey, it was wonderful to hear you. I can see why you're the speaker premiere. So uh, it really was a wonderful insight into all the ways you can grab attention. And I love the storytelling. But here's my question for you. You said you're in a good phase of life because now you can refuse the engagements that you don't want. Mm. And I'm wondering how or what you 
select now? What's your criteria? What is something you like to talk about? Are the groups you like to talk about? Or is it something else, depending on when the alligators are mating? I don't know. <laughs> well, I, have, I have three definitive answers to that. It's an easy question for me. I have three criteria. It's a person or a client I love. It's a place I want to go, or it's an obscene amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with content. <laughs> no, that's my criteria. One of those three things. <laughs> oh, the love part. The love part has something to do with content. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you had a question? Yes, uh, thanks very much. Mickey, great presentation today. Uh, the work that I'm involved with now is helping people in transition. They, they've lost their job for one reason or another. And we encourage storytelling, for sure, because it's a great way to go. I just want to make sure that uh, my sense of how much humor is appropriate during storytelling, especially when in an interviewing situation or a time where you're trying to show the real person that you do have a sense of humor, but you don't, you're not a stand-up comic as such during the interview. Yeah, um, for me, we have a saying in the professional speaking industry, do you have to use humor? And the answer is only if you want to get paid. <laughs> so I, I tell everybody, everybody that I coach or work with, you must use humor. And the best kind is self-effacing humor, showing that you don't take yourself too seriously, but walking that fine line that it's not uncomfortable. You're not making fun of yourself. You're just taking yourself lightly. And I think that's a great thing in an interview to show somebody that you're just not taking yourself so seriously that you can go with the flow. And that's what humor shows people. So I think humor is definitely the answer. Yeah. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Tom, you have a question, I think? I saw your hand. Uh, thank you. Uh, not a question, but an observation. It is said that when we speak, we should seek to bless, not to impress. And I want to thank you for demonstrating that it is possible to do both. Oh, that's Love great. your presentation. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. That's lovely. Lovely. May I steal that or is it copyrighted? <laughs> uh, I just made it up. <laughs> well, quick, so, get a copyright. <laughs> Use it in good health. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else have a question for Mickey? I have one. Okay. Hi, my name's Jackie, oh, and I loved your presentation. You. Um, I love to hear about South Africa because that's where I originate from. I hear that lovely accent. Oh, it brings me back. My friends from South Africa always say pleasure. Do you say that, Jackie? Pleasure. Uh, I do, and everybody tells me they love my accent. Oh, I do. I love your accent. <laughs> <laughs> it was lovely to hear about uh, where you went and um, the wonderful the country. Yes, yes, I miss it so. What part of South Africa, Jackley? Well, I was born in Johannesburg, um, but then uh, about, well, I've been here 12 years, uh, five years prior to that, we built a house in Plenenburg Bay. Did you go to Plenenburg Bay? No, I didn't. No, so that's that's um, on the side of Cape Town, Nisner, beautiful part, and um, so that's that's where I'm really miss most. It's a beautiful country with beautiful people. Yeah, it is. Yes, thank you very much about speaking about it. Anyone else want to ask Mickey a question? Miss Mick, I have a question. Oh, did somebody have a? Question that I said? Ryan, Ryan just reappeared. Ryan, maybe. Ryan, do you have a question? <laughs> Sorry, just unmuting. Uh, just a quick one. So, um, towards the beginning, uh, Mickey, you talked about, um, you know, after your, the kind of the purpose and going through, um, you know, uh, living your intention and, and building legacy. Um, that uh, you've accomplished a, a lot of goals, uh, you know, the uh, living in Florida, the house, the, the car, et cetera. So what's next? What, what, what keeps you going? Uh, trying to decide if there is a next. Is it going to be retirement or I call it rewirement? That's my new term. I'm working on a new speech called rewirement. Pandemics, pivots, and possibilities. That's my new speech. And I think I'm doing that so I'll get my own answers, Ryan. I'm not sure. 
I keep telling you know once we got engaged everybody said when are you getting married and my answer has been we're building a new house we're moving from two homes let's do one thing at a time so I can't make any of those definitive answers till again we get in the new house we sell the old houses I'm open to what the universe has in store well you you, re you let us know when you're ready we'd like to hear that we'd like to hear that speech too <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Maybe so I have an idea for you. Who, who had a question? Go I on. have an idea. Okay, go ahead. Um, as I hear you speak about your childhood, and I think about my 45 years of working with children, your message of being who you are is something kids need so desperately now. So I would love to see you speak sometimes to children, to teenagers, to give them permission to be who they are. Uh, there's so much imprinting that goes on through the media, through advertising. Oh, this is who you need to be. Wear these jeans and you'll be this, right? And you have this amazing, amazing platform to give them a different message. And thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. That's very lovely. Yeah. I try to do at least one or two of these give backs to groups such as that uh, every quarter. Uh, you know, I can't do it all the time, but it's part of my uh, overall business plan per se that I do speak for audiences that can't afford me or need my message and I enjoy it. So. If you know somebody, or if you have people in mind, have them contact me. I'm happy to consider it. Mick, describe your um, what your home and uh, how it's done. Uh, You're not moving in until you have the big reveal. Yeah. What is the big reveal all about? Well, you have to know that my past home is I have a home in Chicago now and I have a home in Florida. And my son nicknamed it Skittles House because every room is a different bright color. So the new house represents a new phase of my life. So it's pretty much white for peace and serenity and calm, but with a pop of color in every room. Just one thing that colors each room. So it's kind of, I think my homes always reflect where I am in my life. Yeah. Okay, all right. Any other questions for Mickey? No? Going once, going twice. Mickey, I'm not surprised with all the wonderful comments you get because I've sat in your audiences many times um, and watched your ability to tell a story and to grow into uh, the amazing speaker you are. And I certainly am truly blessed to have you as a very treasured and dear friend. So thank you very much for being here today and for sharing your, your stories and your information and who you are and what's next in life. So thank you. Thank you to those who put some nice things in the chat. I've read them and I appreciate them so very much. And uh, Joyce and Vicki, I echo certainly what Hope said about how what you're doing is uh, so important and you're doing it in such a great way. So it was a really a delight to be part of this. And I invite any of you to contact me in any way if I can help you or somebody you know at any time. Uh, and, uh, and just think of me when you watch my acceptance speech and enjoy the laugh at the end because you know what it is. <laughs> That's all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.